Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of It Is What It Is podcast. I'm your host, Cody Kelly. We have a great uh, show for you today, really focusing on moving toward reconciliation. I've invited a very special uh, friend of mine, uh, Jared Perkins. Uh, yes, is he a senior marketing exec? It's true, but I just kind of want to give his bio. Uh, Dean's List graduate of Indiana University in Bloomington, graduated in 2010 with a degree in journalism, post-graduation. Uh, he enrolled at Chicago Portfolio School to sharpen his skills as a creative copywriter. Uh, for the past seven years, he has been immersed in the world of advertising, working as a senior copywriter for some of Chicago's premier advertising, public relations, and experiential marketing agencies. I want everybody to welcome Jared Perkins uh, onto the show. Just, just for FYI, he is here to speak on his unique uh, perspective. I think some of the traps uh, and, and the dangers that we fall into is that we feel that we can be a voice for all. Nobody's a monolith. We all have our differing opinions, uh, but we can accept and respect everybody's individuality. Somehow I can't talk today. Uh, we'll be able to build a better world. So with that said, Jared, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thanks, Cody. Really appreciate that intro. And, and yeah, well said. Um, yeah, there are a lot of opinions out there and, you know, whatever can bring about reconciliation, whatnot, I think is bringing all voices to the table is, you know, essential. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Anytime. All right, let's, let's get into it. I want to start here. Um, no, it's a very difficult uh, topic and, and, and question. Uh, but what uh, was your initial thoughts and feelings uh, when you became aware of Ahmaud Aubrey and George uh, Floyd's uh, murder? Well, I mean, like most people, um, obviously just like deep sadness. I mean, I was stunned and appalled, um, for a number of reasons. Um, like for instance, in the case of, um, Ahmad Arbery, like I, it's funny to me because, you know, just given the context of like all of us being in COVID right now and the circumstances of like how he passed, like all of us are a little bit stir crazy and wanting to, um, you know, just get a little exercise and get out of the house. Like we're all in lockdown, you know, hoping to get back to gyms and everything. Um, but yeah, all the, like the guy just wanted to go for a jog. And um, unlike myself, when I can do that, you know, pretty regularly and, and not worry about the, the safety of my life when, whenever I go to like leave my apartment to go for exercise. Um, yeah, it just, I felt, it felt gross to know that that guy couldn't even just go for something that a lot of us just take for granted. You can go get exercise um, in his community. And I, it, it stuck with me with that, that story um, stuck with me with the fact that I read um, after it happened, how the, the, the two culprits who essentially were basically want to be vigilantes based on their rationale for why they did what they did. They're basically like racist Batman and Robin. Um, they, 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 Ahmad came upon them earlier in their jogging route, you know, and like he did the smart thing because he was like, oh, these characters look sketch. I'm going to turn the other way and avoid them. And they, and they pursued him to follow him almost like he was like, he was like, he was being hunted by them. Um, I, you know, I found that appalling and, um, and yeah, like obviously very awful. And it, it it stuck with me that, you know, you wonder if they weren't being, if they weren't caught on camera, would, would he have, they had those two been brought to justice. I feel like, cause it, I think it was like four to five days before any charges were filed against them before they were even arrested. Um, so you wonder like if the, the, the social media outrage and um, the aftermath of that video going, um, you know, the internet, would, would anything have happened? um in that case um when it came to um george floyd like as awful as ahmaud arbery was like with the footage that they had like you could kind of like be you know you, you saw blurry footage with with ahmaud arbery and from a distance with ahmaud arbery it was so much more raw and up close and personal um you know given like you were right there in the midst of the action to see this man for you know, close to nine minutes, just beg for his life. And this guy unrelenting, just keeping his knee on that, on that man's neck was, um, yeah. I mean, I, I watched that video to 
the, for the entirety of, of, you know, that, that arrest and that, that incident. And to see him be unresponsive and still for him to be on his neck for, you know, two and a half, three minutes and not do anything. And people are like, you're, you're going to kill him. You're going to kill him. And people were like wanting, wanting to interject and wanting to do something and feeling helpless because like, how do you, how do you approach a, a cop to say, get off him or like trying to like, you know, like if you saw that with anyone else, you like would take action to push them off. But these are people, you know, armed with, with guns and, you know, and nightsticks and everything else. So, um, yeah, that one, both were hard to take, but that one especially was, was hard to, to watch and, and hard to take. So. Yeah, what, with, with everything, uh, that's kind of going on and just the climate uh, for today, uh, America, right? Like when somebody says like your thoughts as an American citizen, what kind of is your, your, your view of America, uh, right now you're feeling toward America. I mean, it's a loaded question. Um, right now, my feeling towards America is I'm a little bit ashamed of, you know, where we are right now. Um, I do feel hopeful with the, um, you know, the, the reaction to, um, you know, these killings, these, these murders, to, to see people um you know of all races all backgrounds come together to, to to peacefully protest and to do demonstrations across the country in fact you know the entire globe now like this has basically reached you know there have been protests in london and south africa you know i've seen and read about like there may it may have hit all seven continents i don't know if antarctica has hit you know with any protests and demonstrations but like it's that i'm um proud of and glad to be you know an american knowing that people see injustice and they um want to see and affect change um but as far as like coming to grips with that systemic racism is still such a, a blatant issue and having it so you know thrown in our face with you know with the presence of social media and seeing these videos um it makes me sad but at the same at the same time, hopeful because there are people that are wanting to affect change. So I'm hoping that in the case of these horrible, horrible incidents, that some good will come out of it. Um, as far as like how I have felt about this country before this incident, I mean, I, I do like to say that I'm proud to be an American. Like this country has given me, you know, great opportunities, you know, working here in Chicago, you know, as a working professional coming from like, you know, working class, you know, middle class family in Indiana. Um, this country has been great to me. I mean, I won't, I'm not blinded by or um, unaware of the issues that have plagued this country. I know that as much as we like to celebrate our, um, our diversity of, you know, cultures, races, uh, backgrounds, like, we didn't always start off that way. Like our country was founded on, frankly, two original sins, which is, you know, uh, you know, Europeans coming to this land and taking it from Native Americans and then the forcing of people from Africa to come and work on these lands, you know, with, with slavery. So um, it's kind of it's painful to and hard to come to grips with um, that being our reality of our country's founding, but I am, I am glad of the progress we have made, but you know, still clearly you see there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so I'm hoping that long story short and, you know, uh, long answer, sorry that I'm long winded with it, but I'm hoping that, you know, we're coming to grips with and realizing that there's still work to be done. There's still change to, that needs to be made. And I'm hoping like these protests will, um, you know, affect that in the near future. So. Sure. Well, you, you mentioned systemic racism and kind of the, the two, like you said, original sins of America and just kind of its uh, uh, foundation and, and history uh, in your own personal life. And, and you can be as candid or not candid with it. Um, has race played a part? How has it affected you? Because sometimes we only see it from 
our perspective, uh, but asking you, what does that mean? What has race played a part for you? Well, I mean, to be frank, like, to answer your question, no, like race hasn't really affected me as far as like my upbringing. Like I've never faced racial discrimination myself, you know, like they're like white privilege is definitely a thing. Um, it's not, you know, left wing, you know, hoopla and talking points like it, it's it's a legitimate thing. Um, like when you know, you approached me for, for, to do this podcast and to do this episode, I thought of, I tried thinking back to like instances in my past where did I ever feel racially discriminated against? And to be honest, I came up with one story and I'll, I'll be brief with it, but I remember like being, and you're going to laugh at this, but I remember being in second grade mm -hmm. and I was on a school bus on my way home and, and this black kid approached me because I was wearing like an old school, um, Michael Jordan, Chicago Bulls jersey. Okay. Right. And growing up, you know, in the Chicagoland area and idolizing, you know, the nineties Bulls, um, I, you know, loving basketball, like, like I didn't think anything of it because like everyone idolized Jordan. Everyone wanted to be like Mike, but this kid, this, this black kid approached me and said to me, you can't wear that jersey. And I was like, so, you know, being a sec in second grade, I was kind of like taken aback by it. It was like, well, why not? Like, you know, I love Michael Jordan. I love basketball. I like, I thought this is something that we, you know, yeah. could all get behind. Um, but he told me, he's like, I couldn't wear it because I'm white. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. You know, with my little two year old or two year old second grade brain, like trying to wrap my head around that, like, isn't, isn't that kind of racist? And me thinking back on it, I, and having like 2020 hindsight, like, I wonder like what, why that kid felt that way and why he um, approached me in that manner. And it, it dawned on me maybe because like the white community and like the, the path we are given here in America, you know, is so much more clear and direct than, you know, other communities like the black community and other minority communities. Right. And he probably thought like, why can't you, let Michael Jordan be ours, hmm. um, you know, because like being, you know, a white male in America, like I could pull from such a, a huge pool of, um, you know, of role models from, you know, all the American presidents up until, you know, recently with Barack Obama, um, right. you know, most of Hollywood, you know, musicians, et cetera, the list goes on and on. And he felt like Michael Jordan is ours. You can't take him from us. So, mm -hmm. and that, and, and that's what I think happened in that moment and what, what happened in that, with that kid when, when he approached me, um, in that manner. But, um, other than that, as far as like feeling discriminated against, not, not really. And I'm only coming to grips with it now, like having to deal with race outside of just like the protests and outside of, you know, it being top of mind, um, for people right now, but. Like I happen to be, I mean, you're aware of this, Cody. Like I'm married to um, a black woman, and coming to grips with like some because we're planning to have a family in the near future that I'm, you know, going to have black children, and me realizing that there are things that I'm going to have to teach them and come to grips with, like them, like if the climate doesn't change if society doesn't change as far as like the, these systemic issues that we're having thrown in our face right now mm -hmm. with police brutality like do i have to worry about them whenever they leave the house do mm -hmm. i have to teach them um you know have to talk with them about how you handle you know cops when they pull you over when they approach you when you know you encounter them in your everyday life and just to further highlight like like what white white what white privilege means like for the talk for the white community is you know the birds and the bees talk like it's about you know when you hit puberty and you're you know you're noticing girls and all that kind of stuff right. like with um you know having these conversations with like my black friends the talk is very very different the talk is how do you handle police to make sure that you don't get killed and that's just so 
coming from like where I come from, that's just so hard to to put yourself in, in that position to put yourself in those shoes to realize that, you know, not everyone is dealing with the same, um, you know, hand as far as like playing cards, you know what I mean? Like not everyone is um, on the same traje trajectory here um, in the United States. And like I said, like I'm hoping that given like what's going on right now with the protests and and all the demonstrations across the country like i read recently like that it's the the largest uh like political like civil rights movement in the world you know thinking about just how all 50 states have had some some form of protest or demonstration to try to um you know affect change in this issue i think is um is amazing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's something that I realized, like if I married a, um, a white woman, like I could have totally remained silent and apathetic and just carried on, you know, with my, with my day and my life and not really worry about it. But because I happen to be married to a black woman, like I, I can't get around not having those conversations and, and I'm glad for it because I think it's so very important to have these honest dialogues and discussions about what plagues this country and how we can work collectively to fix it. So. Well said, well said. I sometimes in dealing with uh, these courageous conversations, um, is it hard to be outspoken or, or do you feel like I have to say something because if I don't say something, then I'm just as guilty. Like how do you draw the line uh, between being uh, passionate about something and always having to respond to something. I think, I think right now it's not, it shouldn't be hard to have these conversations. I mean, as soon as you turn on the television, look up news, like it's, it's all over, you know, the, the, the television waves online. It's, you know, on everyone's Facebook page and Instagram page, like it's everywhere. So if you can't, if you can't take this moment in time and this uh, moment in history where, especially now in the wake of COVID, when we can't you know, do very much, um, it's, it shouldn't be difficult to have these conversations um, just because it's like, it's taken over everything. Um, not to say that it's not gonna be difficult. I mean, there are gonna be certain instances where, um, you know, especially like in the white community, like we deal like there's a the classic stereotype of having Thanksgiving conversations with, you know, your racist, you know, in-laws or, um, you know, racist grandparents and people of an older generation. Like my, my family comes from the South and are very conservative, very right wing. Um, so in the past, it may have been difficult and like a, a taboo topic to have or just top topic of discussion to, to even uh, think about you know, diving into, mm -hmm. um, but given how it's, it's all everyone is talking about right now, it shouldn't be uh, difficult to discuss in my opinion. Um, in the past, like before, you know, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and um, George Floyd um, in the white community, it may have been hard because of this this feeling of uh, white guilt and, and and shame, knowing that you know a lot of us could very well have ancestors that date back to um, you know the Civil War, who happened to be you know slave owners. Like that could be in my my heritage and my and my family tree. You know, so for some people, I feel like they they avoid having the topic because they they feel like they somehow contributed to the, you know, the systemic racism that continues to plague us. But the fact that if you're not willing to have those discussions, like you're in turn keeping things the way they are, like you're not gonna affect change unless you are willing to have those hard talks with people who may disagree with you, people from different backgrounds from you, even like having these discussions with people, you know, who happen to be black and who are directly impacted by this like there are some people who are worried to even approach the topic with you know with a black person because they're worried of offending or being insensitive but again like if we 
continue to not be open about where we come from, how we feel, um, we're never going to, you know, tackle this issue. So again, a long winded answer, but, um, yeah, like in the wake of, you know, all the, the murders that are happening, what we're seeing, um, in the, in the climate of, of protests and, and everything else, like, I don't think it should be difficult because it's, and especially like in the wake of the pandemic, um, where we're, we're not, you know, tempted to just like say, oh, that sucks and move on and go to the movie theater and go to typical things that we enjoy to like block out like the bad in the world. I think it forces us even more to talk about the, these hard topics. Looking at, uh, like you said, obviously this is going to be a joint effort. Uh, I don't think one group uh, can effectively uh, fight for this alone. When we look at moving toward that reconciliation, uh, what are those steps? Like, how do we as a country say, this is where we are, this is where we need to be by such and such a date? What does that look like? Well, you mean like an action plan moving forward to, to kind just, of... Yeah, like what is the what is the first step? I know, I know, I, I think we're starting to engage and in, in obviously having these courageous conversations. Uh, but what is um, next, uh, especially as, as not you know a, a black person? Like, what do you feel that is next uh, when you talk about really building this bridge of cohesion? I think um, continuing to have these conversations and not just because it's top of mind. I mean, I don't think that we're gonna have everything solved, you know, in the next two to three months. I mean, it's top of mind now because, you know, you see it all over YouTube, you see it all over CNN, MS MSNBC, you see it all over the all over the news right now. So it's easy to be a part of a demonstration or post the, you know, the black tile on Instagram and, and whatever else, but like, we're not gonna have everything figured out and solved, you know, in the course of two to three months. I think that we need to be mindful that this will probably be an ongoing issue and then we need to continue to have these conversations. We continue, continue, we'll continue to have the need to perhaps have another protest, another demonstration, perhaps, you know, in, in the next year, next two years. Um, I think um, an obvious one is voting um, and not just at the, you know, the presidential election, you know, this coming November, but at all levels of government from, you know, local to, um, you know, um, at the national, you know, level. Also, like if you if you happen to be, especially with the issue of just police brutality and systemic racism in our police forces, like if you happen to be in like a, a rural area or a rural county and you happen to have, um, you know, elections for sheriffs, like definitely, definitely voting on and you know for a sheriff like digging into their backgrounds digging into their you know their history like their their record as you know a patrolman or, or whatever um and being mindful of candidates and their backgrounds on these issues you know at all levels um i think also for um the white community in particular um and i've had these conversations with my wife i think that our the education system in the U.S. has kind of done a disservice as to teaching, um, you know, the 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 topics of like the civil rights movement and the um, you know the slavery and the history of it in this country. Um, being willing to dig deeper and look into literature and you know documentaries and to um, you know other content and pieces out there so you can um you know have further knowledge beyond like oh martin luther king did a march on washington he had the i, I have a dream speech and rosa parks you know sat on a uh you know was asked to move from her bus seat once and said no like i feel like there's this baseline sense of what the civil rights movement and what you know slavery and the founding of this country entailed but we are not aware of just, just how horrible it was. And I don't know if it's for the sense to protect kids from hearing the horror stories. Um, like, I know you remember this, like we had that um, event on the South side 
like I think it was last oh. year or two years ago for the, yeah. the Emmett Till event where yeah. like Emmett Till isn't covered like I think at all in you know civil rights you know history curriculum in the United States I think it should be mm -hmm. um for those of you not familiar you know with the Emmett Till story um just this 14 year old boy was killed in Mississippi and lynched um and just basically mutilated for offending a white woman in her in her family store and we went to an event on the south side at, at a church out there where a professor from duke came in to you know basically have a conversation about about that instance about that event and what it meant for uh the greater civil rights movement and me being curious because i wasn't made aware of that story like i did a little bit more research and like looked up the the family chose to have an open casket for for his funeral and if you look up those pictures of emmett till's you know corpse and just to see the like he looked nothing like himself because these you know these bigots like just mutilated him and you know the the, the family wanted to they chose to do you know open casket to really drive home the point of like how horrible racism was in the south you know during the 50s and 60s and i think if more kids kids whether it, you know middle school or high schoolers if they saw like history like that mm -hmm. i think that they would have they would be more empathetic and more willing to stand up for these issues you know because they still continue on to this day you know i mean we see it you know with all the what's going on right now but i feel like we would have more people behind the cause and not less people who are willing to be silent and apathetic knowing that this is what's happened in the 50s and 60s you know all going all the way back to you know the to 1619 um Having that full perspective, I think, would bring more people into the fold to like try to make a difference and try to make an impact on these issues. So I think, like I said, educating yourself on, you know, doing some research beyond what you think you know and what you learned in high school, um, seeking out literature. Like, you know, my wife is constantly pestering me to like, you know, get more educated and seek out like books that we have around the house here. Like she turned me on to, um, I don't know if you read this Cody, um, but the 1619 project that time magazine yeah. put out. Yeah. So time yeah. magazine put out this, you know, multiple, um, uh, articles about just various incidents, basically highlighting the, the 400 year history of slavery and, um, the, the, the plight of African American people in this country. Um, and I'm in the process of reading that. She's, you know, pointing me towards like Cornell West books, like uh, yeah. Michael Eric Dyson. So, um, yeah, for people like me, you know, white people, I think that we need to do ourselves a a service and seek out more, you know, literature and educate ourselves on these on these issues. Um, and I, I said voting already. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are the, the immediate next steps. The immediate. Um, yeah, I, I definitely. That, I was just thinking about sixteen nineteen project, and then kind of the the follow up. Uh, Ta Nehisi Coates is uh, writing on the case for reparations that kind of led uh, after that. Uh, definitely. Uh, well, look, Jared, I appreciate it. I first of all, I appreciate your courage. Uh, like I said before, and, and I restate here, uh, Jared is just a good person. Yes, I see this senior marketing professional in Chicago. Yes, he is. But he's somebody that is just a good person. You don't have to be a hero to be a good person. Uh, and he really wanted to share his insight uh, of just kind of the the current cultural state of America. And I applaud your courage. Jared, where can they connect with you? What are you doing? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn for, you know, all the other professionals out there. If you want to like reach out to me on LinkedIn, just, you know, Jared Perkins. Um, you know, if you find an advertising marketing professional, I should be uh, the top one that, that populates your search um, here in Chicago. Um, I'm also on Instagram. You can find me at Jared Perk the Herc. Um, so that's J-A-R-E-D, 
P E R K, the H E R H E R C. Um, you can just follow my Instagram content, which is usually like me finding cool graffiti in Chicago and sharing my sneaker and comic book collections. Um, and then on Facebook as well, um, just find me at, at Jared Perkins. So, all right. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of It Is What It Is podcast. I'm your host, Cody Kelly, connecting me IG CVMK33. This episode will be out. Also, be on the lookout for the app so you'll be able to watch Jared 24 7 and share this in your classrooms and cafeteria. Uh, but until then, guys, I really appreciate it. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Cody, sorry. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> you can-